sectors and elevational planning. This is a big uh, principle to, uh, to unpack here um, because each one of these usually takes up a good hour or more of a lecture in any permaculture curriculum. We'll uh, at least do a short version here. Zones is the permaculture concept. Uh, radiating zones out from the homestead, the yard, the residence, and you place, again here's your principle of relative location partly, you place elements in the system in relation to these zones by how often you have to visit it. So uh, chickens are usually going to be in zone 2, maybe even on the outside of zone one, pretty close, because you need to visit them every day to check their water, collect their eggs, keep an, you know, let them out of the pen, close up the pen. So they're, they're visited usually, oftentimes, twice a day. So they need to be kind of close. You don't want them way out here in the back 40. Uh, in zone one, you'll want the strawberry patch right outside your door. So every time you every time you go out, you, you can grab those tasty strawberries. You want your kitchen herb spiral. We could make a list of things, but uh, you know you want in zone one your kitchen herb spiral. So you can hop out of the kitchen and grab a handful of oregano and rosemary and parsley and thyme, and boom, you're back in the kitchen. Kitchen herb spiral right by the back kitchen door. You want your plucking vegetables. So your salad, so you can go out and get your plucking veggies and your uh, and your uh, your cut and come again, with, you know, which is your your like you a lot of uh, one thing that's popular now is is microgreen salads. So it's a bed that you cut part of it down and then you cut another part. It's rotational. And so you want that close by. So you want things that you visit a lot. You, but in, in, number two, in number two, you might have the currants and some of the berries. You might have some, some dwarf fruit trees. So you have to visit them more often, but not as often as your zone one items. Zone three might be the, 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 the apple orchard or something. You only have to go there a few times a year and manage it not that often. You might want your, you might have your pastures out here, and you might have your, you probably want your barn if you're having livestock and milking cows or goats or whatever in zone two, so it's pretty close. You don't want too close because of the manure, the smells, etc. But they have access for their, for their forage in zone three, so zone three. Uh, three a lot of times is is the uh, is pastures and zone four is you don't go to zone four, four very often it's wild fruit trees it's maybe <clears throat> rangeland it's mainly forest if it's wet enough it's probably mainly your main forest area <clears throat> your field crops and grains etc usually in uh, usually in uh, zone three. Zone four is your forest and range. You don't go there that often. And zone five is the wild, the wilderness, etc. Now, of course, every homestead doesn't have all these capabilities. This is more like the rural kind of situation. But this can be applied even in your yard. In your, if zone one is the house, uh, the kit, the kit, the the chickens that might be in, in, and there may be a back part of the, of the yard that's like the orchard area, and you may make a wild area by the alley that you have some hawthorn trees or some native trees that are very dense cover and provide places for songbirds to nest, etc. So you can have, even within your yard, 
different zones are how often do you visit. The walkway to the, to the uh, car, for instance, is going to be a zone of probably high uh, input. The back of the garage and the alley might be zone four or five. So in other words, you can put the zonation even, the concept of zones even uh, applies to a yard. It also applies inside a house. Here is our zone one kitchen, uh, zone two living room, zone three bedroom, zone four is, under the, is, is the basement under the house, and zone five are the crawlway spaces filled with spider webs that we hardly ever go to and they're very wild. So we have even inside the house the zoning. The zone theory can also be applied to cities. Your intensely packed inner city, your residential districts, your suburbs, you know, the agricultural land in the peri-urban area, and then back beyond that, the forest and the wild. So zone, the zone theory can be applied to uh, just about any spatial uh, system. So there's the zones. The sectors come in by looking at what energies are coming into your system from outside. So we're going to have different kinds of sectors. For instance, if we, if we have in our homestead uh, a stream that comes through here and, and it has a hundred year flood plain that could flood out to here, we have, a, we have a, a water sector, the water's going through the system, and it has a, could have a serious influence. We really have to consider that, that water sector. We might have uh, the wind sectors, we might have really strong, our predominant cold winds might be coming from that way. So we have a predominant, we might have a, a different time of the year, the winds might be coming from this direction. In the summer you might get light cooling breezes uh, from this direction and you may want to set up your windbreaks and hedgerows to mitigate these wind factors. So we might want to create a, a wind tunnel into the system by creating hedgerows that's going to funnel the air from the when you need the cooling breezes into the system and we might want a a whole series of windbreaks and hedgerows coming in on our coming in this way here for our wind sector here. So we not only look at the energies, we talk about how do we design to to benefit or to mitigate against the harmful effects or to bring in the good effects. We might have a we might have a wildlife corridor sector. And we might have a lot of deer that wander through this way. So we might have a, a deer sector. We might find that we have to put a deer fence up in that sector to keep them, keep them away from the garden. So we, we have wildlife sectors. We can invite certain animals into our system. Uh, by We can in, invite certain birds by, bringing in, uh, by putting bird houses in, bird feeders. What, how can we attract beneficial things in? So in a sense, there's uh, so animal sectors, wind sectors, there's the sun sector. We look at where is the sun coming in here. If, if this is south, we want to keep, we might want to create uh, uh, sun traps that wrap around like this so that the sun can stream into our system and and uh, it's open here so that a lot of sun can come, can come in here. The north part of the place can be, can be much more forested because uh, we don't need uh, the sun. We're capturing the sun in our inner areas, buffering things from this area. So there's the sun, there's wind, there's smells, there's view sectors in the city. View sectors are very, you know, an important part of every design. You've got a yard in a city, like our yard here. We have neighbors on both sides. Their higher windows are going to look into our yard, and so we're going to put up trellis fences uh, with hedgerows, you know, or vines on it uh, to block views. We might have traffic noises in cities, uh, safety corridors. We might uh, we might want barrier hedges in some places. So you're you might have, uh, you, you are always looking at incoming energies. 
A big factor here in the inland northwest is the fire sector. Where does fire want to come into our system? It usually comes from downslope and comes up the fastest. Uh, we need to design the system. If, if this is our fire sector, well, let's put our, let's put our, let's put a pond in here. Let's irrigate these uh, crops here, create a green belt all around the place, reduce the fuel load in this area, and maybe maybe bring the the road the road that comes into the property might very deliberately create a fire break in the system. So we're looking at what those fire sectors are, how do we mitigate it against it? So the sector planning is a real important part of designing any particular property. The elevational planning, again, that's a long lecture, but it's basically how do we take advantage of slopes, how do we take advantage of gravity, how do we place things in the landscape so that the natural, uh, you know, the fruit rolls into the house, for instance, so to speak. How do we, how do we use gravity to our advantage? Um, and how, where is the thermal belt in the system? Where is the warmest air? Where are the frost pockets? Where are the coldest, where is the coldest air? Where are those windy exposed places? What, what do we and don't we place in certain places, you know, depending on elevation? Uh, dirty water, you know, clean water above, dirty water below. Water tends to get dirty as it moves downhill. Where's our water source going to be? So lots of things to think about with elevational planning.